Hello, this video is about free RTOS and trace analyzer library. So what you see on the screen is a Windows program that uh, parses through the trace and shows you all the events or traces that you have captured. In this demonstration, I'll be showing how you can study uh, the runtime execution of a periodic scheduler that I have applied on top of free RTOS. So the objective is periodic scheduler runs the 100 hertz function, the 10 hertz function, and the 1 hertz function precisely at the right timings. For example, 1 hertz is run every uh, 1 second and 100 hertz is called back every 10 milliseconds. So trace analyzer library is a drop-in uh, into free RTOS source code and for a number of processors it works out of the box. There's not much you have to customize. Uh, after you drop this library in and uh, configure a few settings that I'm about to show you, uh, you can then record and stop a trace and then view the trace in this uh, trace elizer. So uh, I, I, I mentioned trace analyzer, but this program from Precipio and the library is actually called trace elizer. Okay, so let's uh, briefly talk about what is needed to integrate this library in. I basically grabbed their source code um, of the Trace Elizer library and I simply pasted it in my free RTOS project and for the most part that was it. You compile it, you make sure it works. Uh, again for Cortex M3 and M0 processor uh, there is already a provided uh, um, portable layer by the Trace Elizer but for some CPUs, you might have to create your own. And there's not much to it. You basically have to provide a function which provides a high resolution timestamp. So the Trace Elizer library can um, trace all the events with respect to the timestamps. So topics to cover today. First one, brief integration of the Trace Elizer library. As I mentioned, it's part of free RTA source code. I just dropped it in. And a couple of key settings you have to fiddle with is first is traceconfig.h. So in this case, I'm using the Cortex-M uh, portable layer, um, namely Cortex-M0, um, although I'm on Cortex-M3 processor, it still works. And one of the key things you have to change is the event buffer size. So I chose 5,000 and that consumed roughly about 24 kilobytes of uh, RAM. And if I choose 1,000, it's, uh, it's close to uh, seven kilobytes of RAM. So I'd say, uh, according to this, you can roughly estimate it's gonna use 4,000 bytes for each uh, thousand value. So this is the how big the buffer size is uh, before the recording buffer exhausts and you cannot capture any events. There's a couple of settings on what to do when your buffer size uh, rolls over. So one of them, as you could guess, is going is a ring buffer. So let me just search for a ring here. So we could choose ring buffer where it keeps on recording in a ring buffer and then uh, you can uh, view the trace um, from the time you stopped it minus um, uh, a delta time that um, uh, has captured all the trace. Or you can basically choose stop mode. In my case, I use stop mode. Basically, when it, uh, it keeps on capturing events and when the buffer exhausts, it simply stops. One of the other key settings of, for the library integration is in the free RTOS config.h. You must define the trace facility to true. So this pound defined being true um, allows free RTOS to call in the hook functions of the trace and uh, an, uh, analyzer library. I'm going to use, I guess, analyzer and analyzer um, interchangeably. So other than changing the use trace facility to true, one of the other key things you have to do is at, at the very end of the file, it's very important, at the very end of the file, you must pound include trace kernel port dot h. This library um, um, then takes over 
and fills in all the pound defines that free RTOS is looking for. I've kind of simplified it, but free RTOS now knows all, 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 all the uh, trace ELISER hooks to be able to trace the function calls. Now, I mentioned about the timer. Uh, you'd be happy to know that um, for a lot of processors, uh, the trace ELISA library can actually tag on to your existing real-time operating system tick timer. So you already have a timer running that provides, let's say, a one millisecond uh, operating system tick hook. Uh, in this case, for the Cortex-M0 or M3 processor, the trace ELISA library can use and does use the existing timer to be able to capture the high resolution timestamps. So you actually don't need a very high uh, resolution separate timer uh, on the side. One of the other things I wanted to point out is in addition to the trace uh, uh, ELISA buffer size, uh, you can also configure the number of tasks and ISRs and queues uh, that the trace ELISA library will trace. The rec uh, it's a uh, um, very good comments over here for you to read at traceconfig.h, but basically uh, you can size it more than what you need. So on my system, I only have five tasks running, so I could use 10 or 15. And then once you view the trace, you can view the actual usage and scale things down as appropriate. This will basically reduce the buffer size usage. Moving on to the next topic. Um, Trace ELISA will work out of the box, but you can help it out and improve your trace by providing names for queues and mutexes and interrupts. So for tasks, uh, it can retrieve the task name by itself. Uh, for example, here, I've created a mutex, and just because you created a mutex using XMFO create mutex, the trace ELISA doesn't understand what that mutex is for, so you can name your mutex. In this case, I named it ADC mutex. So the function call name is vtrace uh, set mutex name, mutex name followed by the name you want to assign. Likewise, when you create a queue, it's a generic queue, and you can provide a name to the queue so that when you are going through the traces, it'll have names next to the queues rather than just queue number five, queue number six, and so forth. Uh, same thing for interrupts. If you have an interrupt number, you can actually set the ISR properties. So for this interrupt, uh, you can indicate that uh, this interrupt uh, number is an ADC interrupt and the priority of it. So in addition to creating your interrupt name, the next thing you want to do is when that appropriate interrupt happens, for example, if this was an ADC interrupt, and you set the properties of this number as an ADC interrupt, then you must have a function call that says store ISR begin and uh, store ISR end. So this indicates that that appropriate interrupt took place and it exited. Now I'm definitely speeding up the pace of this video, uh, but the other function um, that you can use for tracing is basically a manual printf function. So in this case, I'm saying vtrace printf, and this message will basically be logged. And at, uh, towards the end of the video, we'll be reviewing all of these steps. So I'm not necessarily going into uh, detail of telling you this is function x, y, and z of the trace, but I'm going to quickly uh, um, recap in the very end uh, to show you what the outcome of all of this is. And then it's uh, better to go back and look at all the functions you may have added to make the trace possible. So for example, vtrace printf, uh, the first parameter is a channel. So what kind of printf channel? This is a way to group things. So you could have a trace of a debug and all of your debug are gonna be grouped together, all the debug printfs. And in this case, if it's an I2C, all the I2C ones are gonna be grouped together. In fact, if I have a channel name called i2c, I don't even need to say i2c stop because it'll say i2c channel printf uh, traced a message called stop. Now starting and stopping the trace. In 
my platform, I had better luck by starting the trace after all the ta tasks had started. So in this case, my period one hertz function, which is getting called back, remember, every once a second, uh, at the second instant, second uh, instance of it getting called, or at time two seconds, I clear the uh, trace and then I start the trace. And then I log a message under the debug channel, which I just talked about, that the trace recorder has started with a certain message. I don't really need this printf. This was just for um, printing on the console. Then at five second time, now I, the trace started at two and I use the stop mode configuration at trace config, uh, if you remember. So it's not a ring buffer. So I started the trace at two seconds and at five seconds, I'm going to stop the trace. However, if the trace becomes full before that, the trace is going to stop automatically. But anyhow, at the fifth second, I grab the trace buffer and I grab how big that buffer size is. And in my case, I'm not using a real time trace. You could have a real time trace uh, hooked up through the debugger or TCP IP port. But on my case, I'm basically grabbing the trace buffer and the size and I'm writing into an SD card on my uh, board. So by writing into the SD card, I'm going to analyze the tra trace offline. So my board is not running right now, but I've already grabbed the trace of this program. Okay, so to recap what I've done so far before we move on straight to the trace uh, ELISA Windows program to view the trace is I dropped the trace library, my project built the source code. I configured a couple of settings at traceconfig.h according to the RAM available in your system. I enabled the trace in FreeRTOS by enabling the trace facility, changing it to a one. And at the very end, I included the trace kernel port.h header file. After that, in order to help the trace, this is kind of optional. Uh, every queue and mutex and interrupt, you want to provide meaningful names so that your trace uh, uh, ELIZER output becomes a little bit more intuitive. And likewise, by provide just by providing the name to an interrupt doesn't make it happen. In the actual interrupt, you want to say start ISR begin and uh, vtrace store ISR end. Optionally, you could add a bunch of printf statements. In, in this case, I added a lot of printf statements to my I squared C driver. So my I squared C driver is a state machine. I'm going to be showing you how the I squared C driver walks through its state machine to get a data transfer done. And finally, I have started the trace uh, at after two seconds of my system start, you could start the trace whenever you want. So whenever some error happens or you're expecting some event to happen that leads to an error, you can start the trace. And then you can manually stop the trace or it'll stop it automatically if the trace becomes tra trace buffer becomes full and you use the stop configuration instead of the ring buffer. So now I have a trace already open, but if you have the trace ELIZA program open, you basically say file open. In my case, I saved it on the SD card, remember? So trace demo dot binary file, and here we have it. So this is the trace view, and I'm going to be showing you uh, by going through all the menu options, uh, different menus available. Um, if you are an engineer or soon to be an engineer um, you need to know that you need to figure things out uh, yourself and you need to get into the habit of it so i'm not going to go into every single option we have here it's best that you record a trace and go through all the options yourself and explore things by yourself that's what engineers do now one of the most important things i'm going to show is under the view, just go to the trace warnings. Normally, when you open a trace, it'll show you the warnings, if any. A no warnings is really good. View, trace details. 
And this is very important because it helps you see how big your trace buffer was and the utilization of it. So uh, depending on your trace buffer, I could only record as much as 1.7 seconds and it consumed about 23 kilobytes of RAM space. Obviously, the higher the buffer size, the more you can record. And out of the 5,000 records that I defined in traceconfig.h, I ended up using 100% of it, most likely because the trace stopped after 1.7 seconds, because I actually stopped at three seconds after. So the buffer is only big enough for uh, 1.7 seconds based on the number of events in my system. If you only have one task running, you could have a lot larger trace length. Usage per type, you can explore what these things are. In fact, um, I don't have a very good idea myself. There is a lot to explore in this program. And the next thing is these actually were the pound defines, if you remember, uh, at traceconfig.h. These were the pound defines that you had that how many simultaneous tasks and queues you wanted to track. So over here, I uh, only ended up using 5 out of 10 queues, 6 out of 15 semaphores. So remember uh, what I mentioned earlier, that size it bigger. And then if you don't use all 15 tasks, then you can reduce it down to 10. Uh, that could enable you to get slightly larger trace. Simple table is a pound defined. Uh, I'm using about 403 bytes. And a uh, symbol table, uh, this is my guess, so I hope uh, the guys at Precipio uh, are, are going to be okay with my guess. Uh, I only use 403 bytes, and I think the symbol table is the table that provides names to queues and mutexes and, and other things. And the clock frequency, according to the uh, Cortex M3 uh, portable timing layer, I configured it to be one megahertz. So my accuracy of the timestamps is going to be accurate to one microsecond. I'm going to close this window. OK, so let's go over other things that um, I'd like to explore before I show you the real uh, power of this trace facility. Uh, you can, these two are very verbose and, and important things to explore. Event log. Event log is a log of the entire operating system. So it'll actually tell you, uh, so the yellow ones are actually your debug messages. I'm going to exclude them here by deselecting. So it shows you context switches. It shows you when certain task is ready, when you tried to take the semaphore, when the semaphore failed. It tells you um, the VTAS delay parameter, um, the ADC queue, RX queue received something. Basically, all of the RTOS API is going to be traced right over here. And it's, it's quite fascinating. So I'm going to close this view. Uh, user event log, these are all the print messages you dropped. So you can see here that trace record is started. It's under the debug channel. Remember the channel I talked about? It's another debug channel. And then I squared C, I added printf statements for the entire transaction. So I go through four different state changes uh, until one transaction is complete. This was a read transaction. Then I have a write transaction that goes through and completes. Then I have all these print statements, debug statements of temperature and light sensor happening. So this is, and, and one thing that um, you probably didn't notice is if you actually go through and click here, this window on the background updates to actually show you when it actually happened. Okay, so the time is obviously here, but actually shows you when it actually happened. What else? Um, you can go to the statistic report and get the report for a period of one hertz task. If I show report, it actually tells you the CPU time, the execution time, and microseconds, among other things. And I'm going to let you read the documentation and explore yourself. Uh, one other thing that is helpful to know, and this is particularly helpful if you're trying to uh, figure out how things work in somebody else's project is communication flow. It's a visual diagram that actually traces 
how things are working. So on, on this diagram, I can already tell you that there's an ADC interrupt uh, posting to an RX queue and the 100 hertz task dequeues the data from the ADC and does something with the ADC mutex. There is a periodic scheduler, which we're going to be exploring. It's a dispatcher uh, task that dispatches when the 10 hertz, the 100 hertz, and the 1 hertz uh, um, task should run. And the dispatcher sometimes might look convoluted. For example, there's like arrows going back to itself. That, that's because of the design of it. Before it latches or before it dispatches the semaphores for a certain task to run, it actually checks if the previously given semaphore is given or not in, a, in order to check if the task executed on time. For example, the dispatcher expects that the 10 hertz function call, it runs and exits before 100 milliseconds. It expects that the 100 hertz function call starts and uh, finishes before 10 milliseconds in order to ensure that it's ready for the next call. So this is a visual diagram communication flow uh, that is very uh, visually appealing. And again, you know, explore things yourself. And you know, there's all these many options you could be exploring. Okay, so I wanted to explore the periodic scheduler and explore how things are running in my periodic scheduler that is applied on top of FreeRTOS. I like to go into the horizontal view better. So here it is. And I also like to zoom into this one section when all 1 hertz, 10 hertz, and 100 hertz overlap and they need to run. I'm just going to select right here and say zoom to selection. And I'm going to keep going until I get just about the right resolution here. Okay, so this example will demonstrate how the scheduler is really working and it gives you a lot of insights of your own program that you, even you, the designer of it, uh, designer of it might not know. So as you can see here, the dispatcher task runs and it uh, uh, it gives semaphores to the 100 hertz, the 10 hertz, and the 1 hertz. Actually, it didn't get the, the right trace here to trace the 1 hertz semaphore as well. So the dispatcher actually, the reason why it's, it's uh, solid green here and uh, mesh green here is because the dispatcher gave the signal and this 100 hertz task is ready to run at this stage, but it doesn't run until the solid. Okay, so dispatcher told the 10 hertz that, hey, you should start running. But remember, the 10 hertz is only going to run uh, according to its priority level. So 10 hertz is designed to be lower priority than 100. So it's only going to run here. And you have a little bit of uh, dark blue here before the ADC interrupt takes away the CPU allocation. And after the ADC, we go back to the 10 hertz. And then after the 10 hertz, for some reason, the 100 hertz is ready and 100 hertz run. The whole point is 100 hertz wants to run uh, its entire time slot of up to 10 milliseconds, but it might get blocked because of ADC queue or whatnot, and which gives time for the 10 hertz task to run. And the 10 hertz task uh, can interrupt the one, the 100 hertz task can interrupt the 10, but not the other way around. Although I like horizontal view quite a lot, uh, I also like uh, this view because this can give you more verbose statements. For example, if you ever want to know, hey, where's your I squared C transaction? You can actually go to user events and by clicking this, it shows me all of the debug printouts of I squared C and when certain things happen. Now, my I squared C was actually a read and a write transaction. So you have a read transaction starting here, stopping, and then a write transaction starting here and stopping. And uh, this I squared C has an indirect effect on the task that was calling it. So I'm going to zoom in here that might provide better visibility. As you can see here, uh, the reason why I'm guessing the 10 hertz task is, is taking breaks and entering the not ready state as demonstrated by the mesh blue is because it's waiting for the I squared C transaction to start. So in here, 
the I squared C transaction starts probably, and the I squared C state machine keeps walking through in the background using the interrupt context until it's finally finished, which un unlocks the 10 hertz task to finish the rest of the operation and then wait until its next time slot. And as we could guess, uh, the temperature was retrieved from the I squared C transaction. So only when the transaction, the read and write transaction complete, then we have a debug statement. So this blue proves that um, this statement was waiting for all of these uh, things to finish before we have the data output to do something with it. So these selections are very useful. You can select and unselect. And for example, remember I said that I want to talk about the one hertz uh, task uh, when, the, when they all overlap. So I can actually just go ahead and figure out where that 10 hertz, 1 hertz transaction is just by looking at the 1 hertz semaphore activity. Um, if I wanted to precisely see where that is, I can actually go to the event log and I can simply find something that resembles 1 hertz. And if I simply click to act or ready, that's when the dispatcher said that, hey, you're ready to run. So I'm just gonna click here or double click, and it takes me directly to the trace in, in this uh, vertical view. And I'm gonna zoom in here and again, explain you what is going on. So as you can see, the dispatcher comes in every uh, 10 milliseconds, and it dispatches three semaphores in this case. It says that, hey, you, you 100 hertz, you're ready to run. You, 10 hertz, you're ready to run. You, 1 hertz, you're ready to run. And after it dispatches a semaphores, uh, which can be seen by right here, X semaphore give 100 hertz, 10 hertz, 1 hertz. If you did not name your semaphores by using the vtrace uh, set semaphore name API, then you would just see semaphore number 1, 2, 3. So naming is very helpful then the dispatcher basically goes away and lets the 100 hertz run. 100 hertz for some reason gets blocked. It gives a chance for the 10 hertz to run. The 10 hertz uh, gets its uh, CPU taken away by the interrupt and the 10 hertz briefly comes back before realizing that, hey, 100 hertz is actually ready to run because of this uh, semaphore, because of this ADC reading ready and then it runs. Now, at this point, because there's no um, mesh green or green after this, that means this task is now in the block state. It allows the chance for the 10 hertz to run. And the 10 hertz keeps going and keeps uh, getting taken away by the I squared C um, activity. There's a little bit of time for the 1 hertz to run right here before it gets taken away by more I squared C activity. And finally, it finishes up right here, and one hertz finishes up right here. So this this kind of shows um, a very visually appealing diagram of what is going on in your system. And these uh, um, gray areas are basically idle times when there was nothing else we could do. So you could play around with this very visually appealing um, diagrams. I can check when the semaphore give happened. I can check when the take happened. For example, this is where the semaphore give happened for the 100 hertz. And then um, you, you see a semaphore fail here. This is the scheduler design. You can ignore the first three orange ones. Basically, a dispatcher tries to take it to see if a task did not run its time slot and then gives the semaphore. Takes it, gives it, takes it, gives it. But it expects that this take fails. Now, after giving the semaphores, the tasks or the periodic tasks waiting on them will succeed. So, for example, uh, this, is an, this is an important uh, view right here. So, it says that the 100 hertz returns after 9848 microseconds. That means that I, this is telling me that the 100 hertz time consumption in CPU is 152 microseconds out of 10 milliseconds. So you can kind of measure the CPU utilization. Speaking of which, you don't have to figure this out manually. Simply go to view CPU load graph. 
change the resolution to high and this gives you a CPU utilization of your whole system. You can zoom in and you can see when things were utilizing a lot of CPU. For example, you can zoom in here at that very instance and it tells me that 0.48% of the CPU was, using by, was used by the 10 hertz task and 0.75% uh, of the CPU was being used by the I squared C. So it, it breaks down the CPU usage for you, you know, to figure this out yourself. But anyhow, these, these uh, markings also help quite a lot. For example, if I wanted to trace the ADC to figure out when the ADC actually um, happened, I can select the ADC here hmm that didn't really work out the way I wanted but nevertheless uh, you can trace uh, the ADC timing over here too by simply double clicking it gives you more time uh, more uh, detail of that event so this took about 38 microseconds for the ADC ISR to finish so that's pretty much it this is one of the longest videos i made and to recap trace uh, eliza library is open source for the c part but the program that i'm using here depend there's three flavors of it and two of them are paid one of them is free but nevertheless trace eliza library helps you look at your program execution drill down to the details of it if a problem happens you can actually figure out what may be happening in your project and um, uh, thank you very much for watching this uh, video i hope you use the trace uh, eliza library in your projects to understand uh, your own program and it's certainly a very very good teaching tool and also a good tool to understand somebody else's program in terms of what's actually happening in the system if you actually run the trace eliza uh, demo on on uh, Windows uh, Free Arta Simulator. It's actually an even more powerful example than what I have here. Thank you very much.